Um, does Train Collider have the same thing? It must, right? It doesn't. Huh. Which makes me wonder, is it possible that the Train Collider, might there be... As long as the same terrain data gets used for all the bits and it's the same resolution, the terrain colliders should line up all the time. It's possible that there'd be a microscopic little seam or gap or something in between. Probably wouldn't matter. It makes more difference visually because even if everything mostly lines up almost perfectly visually, sometimes you'll still get a little artifact where you see sort of like a little black line or a little tiny microscopic gap. Might not matter for the physics system, which might be why the terrain collider doesn't have it, but it kind of surprises me. But that's going to be a problem for another day. We've gone almost two hours, which is exactly the plan. We now have a system that generates terrain based on a height map. What I'm probably going to do between episodes is I'm going to add more comments on here before I upload it. Um, it's possible, because I don't like the size. I, never, I always say, if your function is bigger than one screen, if you have to scroll to see a function, it's probably not great. Now, part of it is because I do have some extra white space. But as I add more comments, it is going to get a little bit bigger here. And some of this can probably be separated out ever so slightly, like particularly this little bit here could probably get put out to another little function there. It makes it a lot easier to debug, makes it a lot easier to see what's going on because you don't have to sort of like keep all this function in your head while also remembering that you're inside of a loop. Instead, we just pull this out into a little function that cause, that makes sense, like set, set terrain point or something like that. And it's like, oh, inside this loop, we set the train point for this X and Y. Oh, that sounds good. How do you set the train point? Then you look down and see that. So we'll probably do something like that before I put it online because it'll just make it a little easier to, to follow. Um, and yeah, I was gonna talk about, um, I guess we've got, we've got technically 15 more minutes of programming time here. Well, 10, we'll need a bit of a break in between so I can set up the other game. About 10 minutes, I want to talk, first of all, if there's any questions, uh, let me know, I'll take a look at it. Uh, we'll be able to merge this with Project Space Cubes. Project Space Cube, could be the spaceship that you run around in for this, sure. Um, there's also, we did a tutorial about like procedurally generating a whole galaxy. It's mostly a way of talking about organizing data, but there's no reason that couldn't also be fit into this um, as well. This is gonna be standalone. I'm not gonna be merging it with either Project Space Cube or the procedural uh, galaxy generation, but it wouldn't. It shouldn't be that difficult to do. I'm gonna focus on simply generating probably a single planet. Maybe we'll do two planets just to technically show the transition between two different things. So maybe like a planet and its moon, and we can travel back and forth between them. Um, just as a proof of concept, but that'll be it. Generating the rest of the universe will be an exercise left to the viewer. Um, and my spaceship will probably be a single cube or a sphere or something like that, um, rather than, um, you know, something more complex. But there's no reason you couldn't do that, absolutely. Um, what is the goal of the project? The goal of the project is basically to get to that point. We're going to add more details. First of all, the, the point is the idea to be able to go from a space sort of mode and orientation with spherical planets and as you come in it replaces it with appropriate terrain so you can land on it so again sort of Kerbal Space Program um, No Man's Sky kind of thing right where you can land on planets and then take off again that's one part of it there's going to be an extra layer added in for being able to um, add in like uh, buildings and things like this because one of the things that Mighty Spud had requested is specifically not to look at the procedurally generated stuff which again wouldn't be hard right again we're, we're creating our, our terrain based on this height map texture, which we happen to be using a height map texture of the actual moon here, but there's no reason this texture couldn't be generated on the fly by a million different procedural generated ways to do things, right? But the advantage of doing this is then we can pair this, which is what's going to happen later on, with some other sort of like structure map or something like this which we've used trick before. I did a tutorial about making a 2D platformer where in Photoshop you would paint the level where each pixel of your image was a an indicator. Like um, every every brown pixel is a brick. Every golden pixel will actually be a cube or a, a coin. Every red pixel is an enemy. And then depending on like, so the red part would be 255, but then depending on the blue value from zero to 255 tells you what enemy. So you could paint your whole level here in Photoshop and then inside of Unity, it would generate the actual Unity game objects based on those those pixels in this map. Well, the same thing could be happen here, right? So I've got my moon texture, but what I could do is add an extra layer over here, 
um, and then decide, ah, I really want, let's say, so let's say we use the pencil tool and we zoom in in this crater, right? I want some sort of base in this crater. And then depending on, on resolution and things, you can do different things. But again, it can be the thing where, um, okay, everything that is 100% um, blue, so 255 blue is going to be a building. And then I'm going to use the red component. So uh, building of ID 3 is going to be a communications tower or something like that, right? Um, is this image actually truly grayscale? Oh, it is actually grayscale. So let's switch to RGB here. Um, don't flatten. There we go. So now I can have actual blue. And I can say, so here I want that. And then I have a different internal code. So um, where, you know, for number uh, number 57, this is actually just like, it's not even a building. It's mostly like asphalt. So I'm going to do this. So I'm going to have a runway next to communications tower over here in this crater. And then you don't even need the background at this point, right? You have this. And you save this, you can't even see the pixel, but you save this as your sort of structure map. And then you have another pass when you're doing your, your planet generation, you read in this image as well, and you go through each pixel on here, and depending on the color of the pixel, you spawn in a game object. So this tells us to spawn in building ID 3, this tells us to spawn in building ID 57. Again, it'll probably just be basically asphalt, um, but it spawns these in at the correct coordinates, and all of a sudden you've got a base on land. So that's part of it. Then there's, there's some other stuff that we will look at as well, but isn't that a cool way to make planets? Huh? All right, then over here, we've got a completely different thing that we build in this crater. You know, we've got a bunch of different ways of doing it. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can organize this, but I love the idea of, like, literally just sort of having the whole map of your planet and just visually plopping things down. You know, building something at the pole, building something here or there, um, top of a mountain. And yeah, so you just do that. And we've, we've looked at this. This is super easy. You just open the image in Unity. You loop through each pixel in your texture. And then depending on the color of the pixel... You you just grab a game object from an array, like this. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Um, and again, if you look up on my channel, it'll be like 2D platformer level generation trick or something like that. It's like one video or maybe maybe a couple of videos. I don't remember. Um, it's super short. I think it's just one video. And it's basically doing this in the 2D. We'd be doing literally the same thing, except instead of putting a 2D sprite at a particular coordinate, we put a 3D model at a particular coordinate. The, the trickier part will be making sure, and this is something else I did actually a video for at some point, making sure that the um, the terrain is flat in those areas, right? Because like a lot of this is going to be angled and craggy and things like this. And if, if it happens to be on a slope right there, right, and everything will be slightly sloped, and you put a building here, well, either it's going to be in the ground partially or it's going to overhang slightly. So one of the things we have to do is actually flatten the terrain underneath an object. And um, if you follow me on Twitter, back in December, I actually posted a screenshot of me doing exactly that. That was my first pass at playing with the Unity terrain system and learning how it works, was um, I wanted to be able to place a cube on the terrain and have the terrain find these objects and automatically level the terrain there, either bringing things down or pulling things up so that it exactly touches the bottom of the cube. So it looks like these cubes, which are big cubes, they're basically buildings, right? Basically, these buildings would be properly lined up on some actual flat and level terrain. So we're going to be incorporating that idea. So when our terrain generation is actually going to get sort of... First, it's going to generate the real terrain. Then when it places the buildings, it's going to tweak the height map underneath the building so that the building is guaranteed to be on level ground. It's going to be kick-ass. And yes, you want to separate your features map from your height map. Basically, you're going to want a second file. I, I would still work in Photoshop like this, where I have my height map as a separate layer, which I've got here, so that I can see where I'm going. So I'm not working blind, right? If I'm working like this, I'm like, where the hell am I going to put things? I want to be able to see it, place things down, but then when I'm done, I'm going to turn off the background layer, and I, this, is going to get, this would get saved as a separate file instead of being the height map file. Um, and it would be saved like this. So yes, you absolutely do want them to be um, separate from one another for sure. Although, yeah, yeah, you would. Because otherwise, if this is your height map, then wherever this stuff shows up, it's going to look really weird. We could do that right now. If I just uh, flattened, saved, I'm going to be able to, I'm going to have to undo in a second. What it's going to do, it's going to import the new image. And if I hit play, we
Oh, it might not be. It might not be visible, right? Um, dynamic terrain. Let's make this uh, zero zero one one. There should be an area wherever I left those pixels. Should look funny. It actually might be such a small area that you can't see it. Um, let me undo. I want to change this to be um, a bigger area. Just, I'm curious. So if I do this, flatten, save. There's the blue spot. Oh, this is it right here. <laughs> Giant hole in my crater. I think I was seeing it before, but it wasn't big enough to really be noticeable. There, there's the blue spot that I put in. So yes, obviously you don't actually want to edit your height map. Although, I mean, you could if we wanted a big hole here that the normal map doesn't. I mean, you might be hand painting a lot of these. I, I don't know. I don't know how you're going to generate your height maps, but there it is. Um, undo, 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 save. There we go. So now we're back to our proper moon texture. Yay! It's pretty good, yeah? Any other questions going on? Let's see. So with that structure map, you can procedurally generate it also. Yeah, um, yeah, you could. Now, it becomes a little trickier. I mean, then it just becomes a question of how would you pre uh, procedurally generate the text, uh, the structures where you want them. It's not hard. Again, you know, your actual ground texture, you'd probably do multiple passes. First, you would probably add, um, if you were gen procedurally generating this, this map, right? You would probably start with some purlin noise or something like that to get sort of general bumpiness, you know, to get some variety across your terrain. Then you would probably do a pass where you actually drop craters. If you're doing a moon-like structure like this, right? So this would pro this would be something effectively with like no atmosphere to and you know no maybe other orbiting. Part of the reason there's not very many craters on Earth is because the moon actually stops a lot of asteroids for us, which is great. Um, but you know, so you would you do the the the, the Perlin noise or some sort of noise function to get a nice little lumpy terrain, um, you know, in some hills and mountains and that. Then you do a separate pass where you actually whack your texture with um, with craters, and you would need a system for that where you choose a point at random, um, and in that area you would choose okay based on you know how big this particular meteor is supposed to be. You're going to choose a certain area where you're going to drop the terrain down, right? Make it slightly deeper. And then on the outside of that, you're probably going to raise the terrain up just by lightening a little bit, right? Make You're making things a little darker where the crater should be and a little lighter probably just on the outside because they tend to get that ridge. And there you go. And then you probably, you, uh, there's a few different ways you can do that. You could actually, um, you could have a bunch of pre-made crater images that so you'd have some variety, different sizes, slightly different shapes that you would literally just like paint onto your structure. It would be a semi-transparent image, which is slightly dark in the middle, slightly light on the outside. And you would just like merge that with your image, um, which you can totally do in inside of Unity or, or do it in Photoshop, you know, whichever one you want to do. So you'd scatter a few, um, a few craters around. And uh, then the structures would be, do you have a system for deciding where the structures are? You could just randomly place them somewhere. I'm going to put it here, just randomly. Or, you know, you might want to do some things where when you place down the craters, maybe some of them put a base inside the crater, or you might do a pass over the map to find like the highest mountain and then decide to put a building there. Like, you can do all that. And there's no reason you can't do all that. And again, um, it might be quite handy for you to generate all these things as images. And you could save the images. Once they're generated on the fly like that, you could save the image. So if someone returns to the planet, rather than regenerate the image from scratch, you can use your, your cast version of the image. Uh, depending on the scale of your game, you might do something like um, if you haven't visited a planet. Like, you keep, I don't know, a couple of dozen planets cached. So then when you hit planet number 25, you delete maybe the oldest cached version of the image um, and then generate a new one. But as long as your, your, your random generation is done with a fixed seed for the planet. So this was planet one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. That's the seed of this particular planet. As long as you use that as your random number generator, you can randomly slash procedurally generate the planet all over again and to get exact copy of what you had before because you started with the same seed for that particular planet um, which is something that actually happens in in lots of games no man's sky for all of its faults that is an example of that each planet has a random seed attached to it i think they use 64-bit numbers maybe it's 32-bit i can't remember were there like 4.2 billion planets in no man's sky or were there trillions and trillions of planets in no man's sky and that just has to do with the the 32 or 64-bit seed that it uses to generate its numbers um some part of that 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 seed gets used in a random number generator for picking what type of planet arctic barren um you know quite temp um, temperate you know whether it has an atmosphere or not it's just we're randomly generating and as long as you start with the seed then everything else you randomly generate after that will be identical every time if you start with the same seed 
which is a very cool trick. Am I cold? My hands are trembling. No, that's just, that's, that's my reality. I just have the shakes permanently. The caffeine does not help. I'll be honest, but it's a, it's a family thing. No Man's Sky doesn't level terrain for buildings. Um, doesn't it though? I'm pretty sure when you have, when you get to a base in No Man's Sky, it tends to be in a flattened out area with like a building here, a building here, one of those saved towers over here. You know, they, they tend to be in a flattened area. I thought. No Man's Sky didn't have random planets. All of them were the same. Well, and there's that. That's one of the issues with procedurally generating stuff, right? When, when And you're talking about anything, whether you're talking about a dungeon crawling RPG game or or anything, right? Anytime you procedurally generate your your content, there's a risk that while everything is randomized, it can still sort of feel kind of samey in the end, which certainly was a problem with No Man's Sky. And but that's 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 very standard, right? If you have a game that generates ran dungeons randomly, like um, um, Dungeon Crawl, Stone Soup, Net Hack, like any of the classic roguelikes, for example, there's a possibility that everything's gonna, you know, yeah, okay. So there's this time there's a room here and a room here, and the corridor goes this way, and next time it's a room here, 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 and a corridor goes this way. But ultimately, they're kind of samey. Um, and so it comes down to what can you do to your random generation to make them not feel samey while also not generating stuff that's broken. And there's a bunch of different techniques for doing that. Uh, Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup, um, as well as many others, has a thing where like the main dungeon levels are built using one particular algorithm, although even then it has like a random chance of instead of generating like rooms, it, this time it'll generate big room with like sort of smaller buildings within it. So every now and again you get something different and it's got these sub branches where each sub branch has its own completely different procedurally generated system for generating its content. So you end up something that looks more cave-like as opposed to rooms and another one is like an open marsh with like islands. And so that can add some variety. So the same thing can happen with your planets. You can have completely different systems for generating your terrain based on some basic... Uh, initial settings about your planet. Again, how you would want to generate a planet with no atmosphere like the moon versus a planet with an atmosphere like the earth where a lot of the meteors sort of get consumed by the atmosphere. Um, you'd want to completely change some basic steps about um, your, your, um, your asteroid, your meteorite collisions. Also, if something has an atmosphere and running water, then you have erosion to think about, which means after you generate, like the moon would be quite craggy probably, but the earth, those crags, which have originally show up from like, um, um, like volcanoes and earthquakes and tectonic movement, those sorts of things, right? They get smoothed out over the years. So you've got different ideas for how you can, you can add extra passes or add extra intensity of things, but so that's your responsibility, where if you build things by hand, then everything can be wickedly, like, customized and feel right, but then you have to go and design a million planets by hand. It's not KSP time yet. Oh, it is. We're 201 now, so yes, that'll be that. Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup is a great roguelike. Probably still my favorite. It's fantastic. Ba -da 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 -da. You've seen buildings and mountains. Hmm, that's interesting. All right, so we're going to wrap up the programming here. This series will be continued over on youtube.com slash quill18creates. Um, depending on how the week goes, there may or may not be episodes literally this week. Um, this will be uploaded very soon. Um, I'll have to do, again, a lot of this being asked here it is requiring a bunch of extra research for me. So um, we'll see what the, uh, what the timing for these videos will be like. But I'll try to get this uh, to continue as soon as possible if we can. So look forward to that. Again, youtube.com slash creates for more programming stuff. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to play Kerbal Space Program. I just got to go and get everything set up. So see you guys in a couple of minutes, probably. Get up, stretch your legs. Be good for you. Hey, I want to give a big thanks to all the January Patreon supporters and these Mike Check supporters, Yukofin, Snoopy TRB, Pavel Zdanov, Zdanov, yeah, Dracion, Jan Torivel, Michael McClintock, Aaron Toivson, Craig Mortel, The Not-So-Evil Engineer, Julien auger Lafon, Marius Fieldvold, Speedy Savant, Steven Steger, Valiant Cakefeed, Wes Oldenboving, Michael Knudsen, Jason Yanity, Stephen Bonnerman, Kale the Quick, Neil Blakey, Milner, and everyone who has watched, shared, favorited, and surprised, su <laughs> subscribed to this series. Thank you very much.